Everyone wants to be connected online. You want to check your mobile phone where you are. You want to check your email. You don't have to miss. You don't want to miss any message. You get it. So we are getting used to with the mobiles. What about the Linux desktop? So Robert McQueen is here, and he might answer a question. Let's welcome him, please. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yep. Good. Um, just before I start, uh, just a brief aside um, to maybe explain a little bit about uh, a change in what Endless is doing. Um, maybe less of a change and more of an expansion. Um, so maybe when you first met Endless, we were talking a lot about bringing technology to uh, the developing world, emerging economies, however you call it, but uh, making computers affordable and worthwhile um, to people who previously couldn't afford them or previously couldn't connect to the internet. Um, but just to zoom out a little bit, the mission of what Endless is trying to do is about providing access to everybody. Um, so there's a, a universal principle, the whole world empowered. Um, and actually, if we look closer to home um, within the countries that we come from, you know, the, the privileged West, um, actually inequality is a problem. Access to internet is a problem. Uh, access to education can be a problem. Uh, you know, governments make funding cuts, schools don't have what they need to provide access to uh, opportunity and technology. So Endless has a broader mission than maybe what we started with, and the idea is that we can actually do something that can help everybody in the world. Um, so uh, Endless unlocks human potential by improving, improving access to technology and helping people to shape their own technology. We create impact through our own initiatives, supporting partners, and through impact investing. What we mean with this is that there's a lot that needs to be done. We can work in philanthropic initiatives, we can work through businesses, and we're looking to create impact that moves in this direction of giving people the tools to succeed in their own lives, whoever they are, wherever they are. We talk a lot in Endless about this concept of digital agency. So this idea that technology is a tool um, and that what we see a lot in the world is almost an abuse of this tool, that technology is turned into something where you become the consumer and technology is the control. Um, this is the wrong way around. Technology is a tool that we've created uh, as a society and we can use it to be more effective as a society. Um, so my hypothesis is that this concept of digital agency, this being able to control your computer and to control your technology, is the same as the reason that, that most of us are here in this room today. Um, digital agency and software freedom are really two sides of the same coin. The software freedom is, is the key to the door. It's the ability that, that you can control your computer, that you can do things with it uh, because you have the source code, because you have that freedom to, to change and to share. Um, digital agency is the ability to use that power. So it's understanding how to do that. It's understanding how the computer is, is, is able to be used as a tool to, to empower you. So this is the running joke, um, which personally I hate. Um, I, I'm not here to, to beat up on the free software community and to say that we're, we're not doing a good enough job or that you know, this is, ha ha, we've missed opportunity or whatever. Um, actually, I think it's, it's, it's hurtful. Um, that, that almost the tech media and you know, parts of the community have adopted this as, as a joke, right? We, some people here have dedicated years of their lives um, and everyone here is passionate about making what we're doing a success and having that impact and freedom um, on people. Um, so I just wanted to put this here and just say that this talk is not to, to criticize the community or to, to say that we're not doing a good enough job or we have to try harder. This talk is to take this look at how do we achieve the impact? How do we achieve this kind of global success of everything that we care about? Um, I think one of the reasons that, you know, one of the things we need to do to sort of turn the current situation to a success is, is also to look at um, some of the, the failures and actually to, to unpick them and to understand what is causing those problems? What is it that we need to change in our behavior? Um, what hypothesis was proven to be false? Um, there's a couple of examples. And I, I, you know, I work for, for an entity that's trying to achieve you know, mass market adoption of the desktop. So some people may be entirely happy with their software freedom as applied to you know, their desk at home or to you know, the youth club they work with. Um, what I'm looking for is bringing software freedom to this huge audience. 
So, you know, when I look at the success of the Linux desktop, I'm looking at this kind of mass adoption. So what has the GNOME project done and what channels has, does the GNOME project have to reach this large scale? One of them, um, which in some senses has, has been and gone, um, is the, the concept of the corporate desktop. You know, this was the big influx of money, the first kind of dot-com boom, where um, we had these you know, many, many companies um, that joined the GNOME Foundation and, and helped it to be created and invested in this kind of refinement of, of GNOME 1, this kind of slightly mishmash hobbyist thing, and like, okay, now, now GNOME is growing up. We're going to reach the corporate world. Um, but what happened? Um, that didn't quite work, right? These companies aren't here anymore. They're not, well, okay, IBM. But <laughs> Red Hat's still a separate company. Um, but these companies are not here for that reason. They're not here for that reason that they came and they saw that uh, the GNOME desktop would, would allow them to unlock a market and to, to do something um, profitable and worthwhile. Um, so that's one data point. The other one, and I think there are several different uh, companies and different actors in the room who are um, engaged in this OEM distribution pipeline. Right? How do we get to lots of people? Well, millions of computers are manufactured every year, and they go into stores, and they get sold, and people buy them. Like, brilliant. Okay? This, is, this is a big you know, engine of distribution of, of operating systems. So if we get in there, then you know, it'll be amazing. We'll, 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 we'll flow down the pipeline, people will walk into their local Best Buy, they'll, they'll come out with their Linux laptop, and freedom will be enhanced. Um, but does this work? Um, what happens to those computers? Uh, in 2017, um, maybe you'll recognize some familiar faces here, uh, Endless launched uh, with ASO and Asus, um, Endless OS in Indonesia. Um, it was amazing. The, the, the tech press was very fascinated by Endless, that, that we would have something that was actually designed to help people within Indonesia. They're, they're very used to being overlooked by the, the tech industry. Um, that we had something that would work well for people with no internet, because that's a really big problem. You step outside of the major cities, you don't have that. Um, and that it was you know, virus resistant, and it had this, you know, these properties of simplicity and robustness. Um, and this is like super top secret, and I probably shouldn't show you, but um, this, <laughs> this is a graph of the, the daily number of activations um, that we saw. So people turning on their endless PC for the first time in Indonesia. Um, and the, the OEM cycle, just because you, whoops, you, you put software into a, a laptop in a factory, it comes from China, it goes in a ship, blah, blah, blah. It basically takes at least six months for the software that you put in to show up. So we launched endless like here. And then we had lots and lots of activations, and it was wonderful. Uh, and then something happened. It just went away, like gone, endless. We, we actually had to, to wind down our operations in Indonesia because we could not sustain having a presence in the country, a physical presence in the country, um, because we just got completely destroyed in the market. How did that happen? Um, well, there are other people make desktop OSs. Um, they changed their pricing structure. They went to the OEMs and said, um, actually, I'll do you a deal. Why don't you put Windows and everything? I won't charge you any more money. Now, they've just completely removed the incentive or the interest for the OEMs to worry about having two operating systems or testing two operating systems or supporting two operating systems. So they just dropped us and they just walked off. And so we stopped having any shipments. The tail that you see is the stuff that was in a warehouse or it's still in a store and hasn't been sold yet. What's the net effect of this? You know, we, we have these promising opportunities. We go to them with our best endeavors, with our best corporate partners, and we put um, you know, our blood, sweat, and toil into bringing Linux to, to more users. Um, this graph didn't change, right? That's, that's what happened. This is, the, this is the market share of Windows, um, 80%. I mean, if it looks like it's going down, you can also see that unknown is going up, so I suspect a methodology error here. Um, it's still the one to beat. Uh, Linux, Chrome OS, we, even, even if you assume Chrome OS is Linux, um, then below 3%. Is that a problem with desktops? I mean, are desktops kind of dying? Is this something that, that you know, we're, we're chasing, we're backing the wrong horse? Um, this one is a share of, of where people spend their kind of digital uh, time uh, on devices. Uh, the the grey is desktop computers. And, okay, it's gone down a little bit, but this isn't the picture that Apple wants us to believe, that the desktop is this sort of dinosaur, and, you know, what you should be doing is looking at pictures of cats on your iPad, right? That's not true. When you need to do real work, when we do our work to produce you know, designs and documentation and code that produces um, the, the, the whole GNOME platform, 
we do it on a desktop computer. When people uh, you know, do their research in, in universities, when people write their PhDs, they learn accounting, they whatever. No, the desktop is, is a real computer. It's the, it's the sort of tool that you use for productivity and creation. So, a little aside. Um, disruption. What we need to do is disrupt the market, right? Disruption is this Silicon Valley amazing thing. Like, oh, the next unicorn company. I've invested $50 billion. It's going to be brilliant. It's like Uber, but for cats. It's like Airbnb, but then the chef will come to your house. Whatever, right? Um, this idea that there's some kind of magic pixie dust that you sprinkle in a company and you shout disruption a lot, and suddenly, like, yeah, that's it, Microsoft. We're going to get them. Well, um, the word, actually is a real thing. The word is from uh, this c uh, concept introduced by Clayton, uh, Clayton Christensen. So he, there's decades of research behind this um, in the Harvard Business School. He has a, a whole team there in the lab, and he's written two um, fascinating books. One is maybe a little dated in terms of technology, but the innovator's dilemma, um, when new technologies cause great firms to fall. Um, and a more recent one, um, which to me I found maybe even more interesting, the innovator's solution. Um, creating and sustaining successful growth. So I'm going to try hard not to turn this into a business studies lecture, but to me this is a tool and a principle that we can use to understand the challenges that GNOME faces, to go into this marketplace that already has these established giant firms. So successful, outstanding companies can do everything right and yet still lose their market leadership or even fail as new unexpected competitors rise and take over the market. That sounds great, right? How do we do that? Yeah. Um, how can this be? What is it that these companies are doing or that they're blind to that, that we can sneak in under the radar, burrow under the building, and then blow the whole thing up? Right? Um, there are a couple of principles, and I'm just condensing two decades of research into five minutes, so I apologize, but there are, it's very easy to find more information about this online, and I'm, I'm really happy to explain it uh, to anyone. Um, the, there are a couple of principles that, that cause companies to, in a sense, be blind to these new um, opportunities, these new threats, which are, should be appearing on their radar, and yet they somehow don't. So um, if you have a customer base, if you have a successful product, then it's much easier to find data about those customers, to find data about your channels, what your partners want, what that marketplace wants. So this idea of sustaining innovation, so these incremental improvements where you polish performance, you add a new feature, um, you know, you're making these incremental steps in order to provide more value and more functionality and more performance to your existing customers. That is much easier and much cheaper than this idea of, right, I've got you know, 10 people, we've got this crazy idea, we're just going to go from the start and we're just going to go into a completely new space. So the sustaining innovation is cheaper for these larger companies. Um, which means that it's also more profitable. So if you have an existing user base, you have existing customers, and you want to, to make more money, right? Your shareholders, your CEO requires an you know, increasing year-on-year -year profit. Um, the stock market isn't happy with average growth. The stock market wants above average growth. So you have to like, step it up a notch all the time. Um, so you have a bias towards your existing markets. Your existing markets are well understood. They talk to you. You can find market research. You go to Gartner, desktop segmentation by country, whatever. Um, and this imperative to make more money um, causes the large companies to make very rational decisions in their management chains and where they allocate resources that bias them towards the already known markets. It biases them towards the already known customers and the channels that they work with. Um, so. There's a lot more detail here, but <laughs> um, in terms of, of actually working with channels like your partners, you know, so Microsoft gives the OS to Acer, Acer gives it to a distributor, the distributor has a sales team that goes to the store and they sell it to folks in the shop. Um, that all happens with everyone's knowledge and familiarity and comfort with Windows. Right? So when someone walks into uh, you know, a, a PC store in a mall in Indonesia, they have already come to buy a Windows computer. The sales guy is trying to sell them a computer with Windows on, um, you know, all the way up the chain. So even if we convince Acer to ship Endless, then the moment it goes into the factory, then um, they're already like, well, I don't know how this works. The production line set up for Windows, all the drivers work, and then this thing is just weird and it's a pain. Um, and then by the time it goes into the store, 
um, the guy in the store can make more money by installing Windows, like a pirate copy of Windows on a computer, than he can selling the computer. So like, every, every person down an entire chain doesn't want it to change. They're all incentivized and familiar and comfortable with the status quo. Um, so the companies will invest in supporting and enhancing their you know, revenue per user or whatever in those channels. Um, and actually, if something kind of wacky turns up, like it's, you know, oh, you're trying to sell computers in like rural Africa, well, those guys don't buy computers. Like, how is that a business? Like, pff, you know, we've had that conversation with these companies. They just don't understand that, you know, there's one billion people, whatever, that do have computers, and there's six billion that don't. Maybe some of those want computers, and they're just like, nope. We're putting five NVIDIA GPUs in the same thing, and we're going to make a thousand bucks selling this like super gaming, like amazing. And, right. But for them, that feels good. They they are responding correctly to their management incentives. That CEO is doing the right job. They are making more money out of their customer base, more money for each sale. You know, the graphs go up and to the right. The shareholders are happy. So actually, ignoring low end competition can feel right for companies. It can feel helpful. Like this is low margin business, right? I don't care about this. This is, this is noise. That's where we can sneak in. Um, disruptions separate into two categories. So one is this concept of a low-end disruption. Um, a low-end disruption is where you're entering an existing market, but you have a, a way of producing a product. Your business cost structure, the amount of time and energy and, and resources um, that you take to produce your product and deliver it to the customer is significantly less than the existing market. So there are some examples here that, you know, like photocopiers, right? Copy shops have these massive, expensive, like, you know, fill the room machines. And then, you know, what a Canon turns up with like a little kind of crappy photocopier. It's kind of lame, but suddenly it's like an order of magnitude cheaper. Anyone can buy that. Um, then you, you have, you know, the way that you produce your product is less. Now, when we think about GNOME, um, when we think about you know, fighting it out feature by feature with Windows or, or Mac OS or something, um, in fact, it costs us as much in terms of resources and time to implement a desktop as it does anyone else. There's nothing about our desktop that makes it cheaper or easier to work on than other people. Sure, we can share the source code, we can work on it together, but ultimately, if you want to produce a desktop, you're going to need a few hundred people, and you might have a few hundred people as well. We are not cheaper to build a desktop than uh, the existing things. And this also explains, to some sense, why Microsoft was able to just change their pricing and, and just kill it endless overnight in, in Indonesia. It's because they actually have less cost than we do because they've already built the desktop. Their sustaining innovation to improve the profit of their Windows deployments is, is very cheap for them. So we can't just go in and say, look, free, it's cheaper, because the, the economics don't work. It's not cheaper for us to build it, even if it's free at the point you hand it to the customer, because it's free. Um, free software isn't free. Someone else has already paid for it. Right? That, that still takes resources and time and effort. Um, the other one, the other way that uh, you succeed with a disruption is, is you, you find a different part of the market. So you find a group of people who are, have a job to do. They want to do something. They potentially are interested in the type of product that you have. But they don't get the current one. Right? They have some reason that prevents them from accessing that. Um, they don't think it does anything useful for them. Um, they, uh, they, they don't see a need for it. It's not something that's useful for them. Uh, that's for other people. You know. So this idea of competing against non-consumers, so, sorry, you know, of targeting non-consumers. So we have a product, and we get it to people who don't currently buy the existing ones. Um, this means that they're either underserved, like the, the, the product that's there just doesn't do anything for them, um, or they're unable to get to that product. This is the one that I think is interesting for us. So what if we could find a group of people who wanted a desktop, who wanted to have a desktop, we could convince them that they were achieving something useful with a desktop computer that they weren't currently able to do or they weren't currently doing um, with the things that they could buy. So we would need a group of people that would meet those, meet those criteria. Uh, we would need to be able to 
produce something that satisfied their needs and, and gave them a reason to have a desktop computer and to make GNOME the best thing for the jobs that they're trying to do. So that we would give them a reason to buy a desktop and for that to be a GNOME-based desktop. So here is my humble proposal. Um, <laughs> I was talking to Jonathan Banford yesterday, and he, he told me that you know, this, this would not be the first talk at Guadec where someone appears and says that they have the solution. Um, so I, I must humbly propose that this is a potential solution um, for the GNOME project to find a underserved market, something where the desktop could bring them something that they do not currently have. Teach kids to code. Why? 90% of US parents want their kids to learn how to code. It's a study by Google and, and Gallup. The, this concept of digital agency, everyone feels it. It's something around the world where no matter if you're in Malaysia or if you're in Kenya or if you're in the US, you ask a parent, what is it that you want your kid to learn in school? What is it you want your kid to be able to do? Um, uh, uh, digital skills, uh, programming, being able to, to use technology, because everyone can see that this is the march of, of society. This is what you need to have tools to equip you in the workplace and in the wider world. And the data firmly supports that. Jobs that require coding skills pay up to $22,000 more per year on average than those jobs that do not. Um, few other skills open the door to as many well-paying jobs nearly half of the jobs that pay more than $58,000, this is a US study, that require some coding skills. This is true around the world. This is something that we can sell to everybody. Every parent wants to set their child up for success in life. They want their children to be able to do better than they did, to know something that they didn't, to access uh, you know, opportunities and be able to s sustain and uh, succeed in life. And that's a, that's a thing that's actually quite hard to do. Right? So I, I'm a parent. My children are not quite old enough to learn to code. But I, I've also spoken to many parents in the process of, of coming up with these ideas and refining them with the team at Endless. And there is, to some sense, a gap in the market where you start to learn to code as a child. And you have these very beautiful and very well-designed products that bring you into an environment. So you have things like Scratch, which are fantastic. You, know, you start to put the box together. You understand the code behind them, the iteration and the recursion. And they're a thing of beauty. They're, they're fantastic. Um, there are many different tools that have this kind of concept of, of you come into this safe environment, and then the concepts of computing and coding are explained to you. But they also have a shelf life. Right? Once you've done them, once you're the master of that domain, once you know every way to stack every Minecraft block on top of another, or whatever, right? then you can kind of get done with these things. You figure out that, OK, I now know all of this. I understand it. The robot will follow the line, whatever. right? And then you end up in a perspective of having this kind of glass ceiling. What do I do in order to, to surpass that? How do I actually make an app? Right? How, do I, how do I write a game? How do I put something that's really cool for, for, uh, for my friends to do to see what I'm doing? Um, and then it gets much trickier, right? You get real code, you get all these gnarly computer bits, you get compiler errors, you get IDEs and things. Um, so this idea that there is a transition that's not currently well supported suggests that there might be a gap in the market. Why don't we go there? Why don't we do something which actually helps people into not just becoming GNOME contributors, that would be fantastic, right? But also to just having their first adventure with code being something that the, the GNOME project helps them with, that we actually give them the tools and the scaffolding to not just kind of play within a sandbox, but to kind of enter the wider world. We can be there as their guide and, and, and help them to explore and to, to have some, some goals and some excitement with becoming the master of their computer, you know, learning these digital agency skills so that they can exercise their software freedoms. We know a lot about this. Many of us have been on this journey. Um, I mean, I, I learned to program by hacking IRC servers and um, mud demons through Star Trek role playing. Right? Games got me into programming. But then I learned to program 
uh, through that, and then that became my vocation. I was lucky enough to find this wonderful community and to, to, for that to be something that, that became my job. So games are good. Games are cool, right? That's something that we, can, we could use. We have all of the source code, down to the device driver, sometimes down to the firmware. We have, this is the diametric opposite of a sandbox, right? It's not like we're an app running on some closed ecosystem in someone's app store and, and you know, meeting their terms and sandboxed and unable to access the real deal. We have the whole thing. We can teach anything. We can take your first Linux device driver module, your first web server, your first, I don't know, database engine, although I guess Christian Hogarth would recommend against that. Um, so, you know, we've got everything. It's real. It's real world. Linux runs the entire world, you know, from phones to supercomputers to, to routers to network infrastructure to all of the servers in the cloud. You know, this is, this is real. This is not like, oh, yeah, play with these things and then whatever. This is like learn, learn with, the, the, with the live stuff. And, you know, selfishly, we as a project, we always go and we always look for this pipeline. You know, um, Kat gave a talk yesterday about um, the challenges of actually finding, recruiting um, uh, salaried engineers to work in Canabra, that they actually see this, this, where does the pipeline come from? Where does the new contributors to GNOME come from? And how do they scale that and sustain that? So, yeah, okay, if people are going to learn to code, and they probably will if they're motivated and they have the resources to do so, why don't they learn our stuff? Why don't they learn the tools of our trade and they learn how to become people who are not only care about uh, software freedom and digital agency, but they care about and understand the GNOME project? Wouldn't that be cool? So, yeah, it all comes to this idea of, of using our strengths, using our software freedom, the source code, our welcoming community, and the technology that we have to give people the ability to control technology so that the technology that you control, not the technology that controls you. <laughs> so, um, I have a little video here um, which I would like to show you. The sound will, you won't be able to hear it, but it's not that important. How would you save and edit a photo? And this first. And this Fedora box, close to Vanilla Gnome. mentioned this in his talk yesterday, like, oh yeah, photo editor, that would be good, right? So the reason I show you that, again, I'm not here to try and criticize the project, but I'm, I'm trying to make a point that um, to enter this marketplace to actually gain the, the attention of children. So you know, back to the graph that showed desktop usages like this, mobile device usage is going up and up. This is a, we are having to compete with people's attention, with the polish and the appeal and the attractiveness and in some cases, the psychological addictiveness of things like social media and things. So we actually have to come up with something that is, you know, it pops, right? It has some, some kind of compelling, it's attractive, it draws people in, and it doesn't turn people off. So there is, 
there's work to do. Right? This is one of the things that Endless has been working on, and one of the reasons why the Endless desktop looks very different to the GNOME desktop, because we've done these studies that have told us that we need to change it. If we want uh, a computer that, that a parent is happy to put in front of their child, and to, to not confuse themselves, let alone the child, or vice versa, right? Um, then there are things that need to change. So we're here to do this. We, we would like to help. We, we would like to bring the GNOME desktop into this new marketplace. What are we doing? The first thing, which I find super exciting, I don't know how much you like nonprofit foundations, um, but <laughs> we are investigating moving the endless OS, the ownership, the team, and the platform into a mission-based social welfare nonprofit uh, foundation. So the idea that we can use philanthropic funds and run philanthropic initiatives to focus on achieving everything I've just said, to actually bring free software into the hands of a mass market, to actually achieve impact at scale with enabling people's access to technology and their ability to succeed in the world through technology. I don't know if over the past year or so you've noticed that there's been a little tweak in the course of, of the Endless team. I hope you've seen more of us in GNOME, more of us spending more time uh, in GNOME. We've had all of these patches and all of these branches and things, and we've been pursuing this you know, very commercial imperative to like, we have to build a product, we have to get it out the door. We're fighting well. Um, this isn't a sprint anymore, this is a marathon. Um, the, uh, the, the non-profit structure allows us to just chill out a little bit. We have to be here for the long haul. We have to work with the wider community to make sure that we're able to succeed, that we can gain that impact. So yes, we are working more upstream. We will continue to do so. And I hope that in your respective modules that you've seen that happening. Um, we want more of that. And the conversations and the improvements that have come out of that have been very good. And the financial support, and we sponsor the GNOME Foundation. Um, we've, uh, we've just announced the uh, coding prize, the grant that, that Endless has made to uh, help to bring the community into our process of, of delivering coding education using GNOME and free software as our platform. So how can you help us? <laughs> um, I guess I've touched on this already, this idea that, that the, there's something about the product that we need to make it a bit more engaging and a bit more accessible and tangible and, and actionable for people to, uh, to, to turn up to and, and to compete for that mind share and that attention span. Um, so the accessibility and the usability, so just the ability to jump in and find something in Endless that, uh, or in, in GNOME that just grabs you and engages you and like, oh, what's this? I'm going to explore. And like, oh, that's cool. Whoosh, you know, it has to have a bit of bling. You know, we have to be something that's cool and exciting and, and fascinating. Um, I don't know if, uh, if anyone saw the, the, the talk about hack, but uh, the endless hack products, but that was uh, you know, looking at these design values and, and providing things that would, would try and draw a child into our world to kind of come and see, like, this is actually some coding stuff you can do. And, oh, look, you know, your first web page, and you know, this is how you make your first you know, Git pull request, right? <laughs> Um, another thing, and the reason why we, we've looked for um, you know, the parental controls and pushing those kind of things upstream um, is this idea of safety. Um, Endless has a head start on this because you can just take an Endless machine offline and you can still basically use it. So we have content, we have encyclopedias, we have tutorials, videos, games, everything is built into an Endless machine. So that's good, right? The internet's full of weirdos. You don't want your child to spend all this screen time looking at these kind of strange machine-generated videos on YouTube. So safety and respecting the privacy of children, you know, there are regulations there. Um, there's also a kind of moral concern that we don't want to be producing these computing devices where we become the controlling force rather than the, the user being in control. So that's important to us as well. Um, I think it's important to GNOME as well. Um, so I hope that this is somewhere where we can collaborate. Um, but I think maybe the most important thing is, is, is the reason why the grant that we've just made is, is, is a prize. Uh, it's because we don't really know the answer, right? You know, back to my humble request is, is can you join us on this journey? Um, we, we will put our resources into bringing Endless and bringing GNOME with it out to a wider audience. Um, but you have better ideas than we do. There's more people out there than there are up here. Um, 
So unleash your creativity, your imagination. If you have kids, what do they like about computers? Can we do a free software one of those? How can we make sending, opening a Git repo more exciting? How do we make it more approachable and understanding, uh, understandable? How do we make the process of, of playing with a computer and then breaking it safer uh, and, uh, and engaging at the same time? So this is the call to action, really, is, uh, is you know, to, to, to look at the prize when it comes online in January, then, then we have resources available to support people to make teams or as individuals come up with ideas. And it should be enough money to, to, to work on that. Um, then, you know, what can you think of? We, we open this space up because we know that we need different ways to catch the attention of different people. We need different things, and we need to try them and to see what works. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Hi, a nice speech, by the way. Uh, subject of uh, making Microsoft monopoly like less threatening and less menacing is a very, I mean, it's a very long time. Many people have tried to solve that. I think if you want to look uh, example for how, how to do this, you have to look at Dell. Dell at one point decided they wanted to do Ubuntu um, because of their fallout with Microsoft. Basically, they did not listen to them. They decided to ignore their charms and they went and, and created Line, which is still active today and it's basically all web development companies I know buy directly from Dell computers with Ubuntu Linux. So I guess that's the point what I'm trying to make. We need more such stories. Can we help OEMs to dwarf this Microsoft just comes in after you have spoken to OEM and how to convince them not to give in to the charms right away. Uh, because I guess is the point, there is examples that if you don't do this, you can have su quite success with Linux. That's one thing. And another thing is not, not, not a question more, I completely agree, agree about uh, learning code. Uh, that's, that's a nice getaway for, for us. Thank you. So this... Um this partnership between Dell and Ubuntu, um, for me, my, my, my assessment, and you know, I don't have something inside track here, but my assessment is that there's, there's two jobs that it's doing. Um, uh, and one of them, which is a long-standing thing that you see in OEMs, is, is just a little bit of just poking Microsoft in the eye, or maybe just in the ribs a little bit, to just say, like, we've got options. Right? There are possibilities for us to, um, to, to, to use different platforms because that helps, right? If you have one supplier, then you're in a stranglehold relationship. You know, HP has 99 Intel laptops and they have one AMD or whatever. It's just like, yeah, we, can, we could do something else. Why don't you give us a better price? I mean, Intel had an entire netbook team working on Migo netbook. Uh, and what that achieved is, is a lowering in the license fee of Windows, which for Intel sold a lot more CPUs than they ever did on the netbook. So there is this kind of uh, ability, there's an appeal in having alternatives. Um, and the other thing for Dell is, this is not a cheap laptop. This laptop came with Ubuntu on it. I'm sorry, I put an on. <laughs> um, I love Ubuntu, use it for years, but my, my allegiances have changed. Um, the, this is not a cheap laptop, right? This is a competitor against developers working on a MacBook. So from Dell's perspective, looking at the theory of, of disruption, this is a sustaining, disrupt, uh, sustaining innovation. This is the idea of providing additional developer value to an existing market that they target. They, they put Dells into shops and then web companies buy them, right? So um, yes, we need to look for these wins, but this theory of disruptive innovation also tells us that, that Dell is less likely to be the partner that will help us to, to do that. Um, we actually have some partners in, in uh, Kenya who sell computers in, in a mall. 
Um, and they sell the same computer in two shops. In one shop, it's a, it's a hardware store, but you know, electronics, they sell the computer there. Uh, and they also sell it basically opposite in, in a clothes store. Um, they sell more in the clothes store um, because they, they actually are able to sell the computer to families, um, and the clothes store has better credit. Um, but one of the things that this, uh, this disruptive theory tells us is that to disrupt a market, you usually also need to disrupt the channels because this incentive structure that causes Microsoft to look at their empire and think, oh, this is fantastic, um, also causes all of their suppliers and the people down the value chain to do the same thing. So when I go to Acer and tell them, no, you can sell loads more endless laptops to a new audience that, that you're not currently selling to, they, they don't get it. It's not a line in their spreadsheet. It's not something that they can measure or they can get excited about. So um, yes, those partnerships would be fantastic. Yes, we are shipping with these OEMs. Um, but that alone is not sufficient because the entire value chain needs to understand what we're doing. We should take our computer and we should put it in a toy shop. right? Then the toy shop will make more money and they want to sell. I just wanted to quickly point out, this is the reason why most companies I know buy directly from Dell. They don't go to these lower chains. They basically say, I want Ubuntu Linux. Here's the Dell direct shop. They just buy it. They don't care even to go to these companies. Yeah. But I understand we have to reach them. We have to find to disrupt them. Yeah, we, we have to find the channels that, that allow us to scale up. Those, those Dell computers, if they didn't have Linux on them, then they would be bought with Windows and reflashed with Linux. That doesn't enlarge this audience here that we need to get GNOME to. It's great, right? but it's not, it's not the game changer. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incremental change. <clears throat> yeah, so in, in one of your slides, you're talking, you had this, uh, you know, the, I guess, starting coding efforts, and then, of course, it's more advanced. So, so how would you differentiate what you want to do here compared to Raspberry Pi, which I guess is sort of trying to also be in the same market, right? But you sort of put them quite high up on that graph. So, so how do you, how do you, I guess, yeah, how do you differentiate from Raspberry Pi, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, well, through one lens, they're a potential competitor, right? Through another lens, they're a potential partner. Um, so, I mean, the, uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 is quite interesting. It's kind of reached a certain level of, oh, we have a bit more RAM, but we have open source video drivers. You know, the, uh, my, my team in Taiwan has got them on their desks, and we're like, let's, uh, let's see what we can do. Um, I think the Raspberry Pi Foundation is, is aiming at a certain age group, so kind of primary school education. And so the, the tools that they provide, the environment they provide, you can also kind of reach a limit where you want more power and you want more, more to access. So there is an age band there and there's gaps to fill between I've done all the Raspberry Pi exercises and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a GNOME hacker or I'm writing my Node web apps and things. Um, but for sure, they are active in the space and they should be considered friends that we can, can help to bring more value to their competing platform and their education can bring more value to our desktop. So, yeah, hi. Um, I think additionally to um, suggestions you made to, make, uh, to bring a Linux desktop to the coders, I think uh, you also need to, to look at regular average dude running his computer and um, um, I think there are many people who actually the current Linux desktop likes it, he, he tried it and he likes it, but at some point he just stops to use it because he doesn't find his third party apps he is known to and I think this is also really important because um, yeah it's, it's, it's for example if you want to compete with I don't know with a car vendor you can't, you can't sell bikes, you know, you, the people want the car, they want uh, four, uh, four wheels, so you need to have something similar. You can say, okay, but we have bikes, why don't you buy bikes? It's like they want the apps and they look for the apps and if they don't find it, they don't sometimes they quit to use a Linux desktop. Even if they like the desktop or I think, wow, that's running fast. Yeah. I, uh, I both violently agree and violently disagree with you. I violently agree that the availability of compatibility and apps and uh, a, a worthwhile ecosystem of vendors bringing things into the Linux desktop is a huge component of our success. Um, however, 
if we are trying to grow the market by achieving more Linux desktop seats, then it's not sufficient, right? Because we do not have the resources to unseat the entire software ecosystem of Windows or, or Mac OS. So I put this graph on the screen is because it, it has too many words on, but it explains this, right? So um, on the side here, it says different measures of performance. So the principle uh, underlying disruption, the new market disruption, is that the existing marketplace regards the performance of your new product by their current criteria. So does it run Windows apps? Can I run Microsoft Word? Will my random thing run on it? Now, that's a war of attrition. Right? For every feature that we add, everything that we can do, which we have to spend new money on and they've already spent it, um, there's another one because they can very cheaply move up this line. They can always add performance and functionality and meet, better meet the requirements of their existing customers. So the winning move is not to play. The winning move is to say, actually, um, this eight-year-old doesn't care whether they can run their you know, book sorting application, which they've loved on Windows for 10 years. We actually go somewhere else and we say, we need a different standard of performance to address a new market than they have a different set of criteria. Of course, it's not like a black and white thing. There's no kind of bright line that we're going to step to the other side of, and suddenly we can throw away all the requirements that we currently address. But the criteria through which our entrance into this new market will be uh, judged on are not specifically the same as the ones that we've already been working with. If we compete, you know, this is the pie chart of desktop users. If we compete against the users inside that pie chart, then it's a very expensive and takes a long time for us to gain a really small market share. That's what we've been doing for 20 years. We want a new pie, right? We want to go somewhere else and say that we're going to put millions of people here. And OK, it's great if we have Spotify, right? But that itself isn't the critical success factor. What's critical for the success is that this teaches the code, that parents buy it, that it does something that engages people, and we offer something that's just not there in the other picture. Just one last reply. Um, if you look, for example, for the Windows Phone, <laughs> it was something like switch positions. Windows was a small player, and Android yeah. is yeah, it's very dominant. It's, and it's the same. It's entering the yeah, same market. It, 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 it worked. It worked really well, I think, maybe better than the desktop <laughs> Windows. And um, but there were many, many apps and. Behind every app, there's a developer, and the developer needs to set up his uh, his computer for also developing apps for the Windows mobile. And um, I think at some point, many developers just didn't want to make it, and so the the store was really empty. There w there weren't many apps, and they I follow the users, right? If you have a massively compelling product, then you'll want to develop for it because then you can sell to your app to more users. So when Apple sold you know, bazillion iPhones on the first day, then of course the developers follow. So like, well, I can put apps here, and then I can make more money than this Windows Store or this whatever it was, Symbian Store that created it. But entering into that marketplace was already a crowded marketplace. And through this principle of disruption, Microsoft got their ass handed to them. Right? So they, <laughs> um, they, they weren't able to keep up with the existing players in the market who were adding incrementally more value to their products the channels were already drawn up. The marketplace expected the products that existed. They weren't incentivized or motivated to get the product that didn't meet those criteria. So they failed. Microsoft can fail. The principle of disruption can also <laughs> can, can cut both ways. Um, but if we have the users, then that will build and draw value to our ecosystem, for sure. Why don't we have that many apps on Linux? This has been around on the users. That's it. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, it was really inspirational. Um, I want to th particularly thank you for having worked on Hack in the past. I don't know if, if this is sort of part of your vision for the future, but I mean, I thought that was a really important thing that you'd worked on. Particularly thanks to Philip for having worked on that as well. Actual question um, related to how you talked about Microsoft back at the start, Microsoft killing you in Indonesia. I was thinking about whether there's potential for immediately being killed on this again, and my f my mind obviously jumped to the fact that Microsoft have GitHub now, obviously. So. Basically, I'm sure you've thought about this, but what are your thoughts on whether Microsoft could immediately kill anything that we try to do here by using the power of GitHub that they now have 
like in that area. Like they, they obviously have a lot of developer kind of stuff under their umbrella now, particularly open source stuff. I mean, it seems like it could be a risk for us. So, what are your thoughts? There? Um, it's a superb strategy for Microsoft, right? So, so they're facing in their their headwind for developer mindshare, right? People who write websites or do code or make apps, or whatever, are equally happy on uh, a Mac OS machine or even a Chrome OS machine um, or a Linux machine than they are on Windows. And this, you know, is a is a hole in the boat. So they move to address it by things like, you know, Windows services for Linux. Like, let's bring the tools people want to see. Let's have that nice Unix thing and Docker or whatever. Let's provide all those things in Windows and make it more comfortable for people. Um, I think that um, there's also synergy with their cloud services with Azure. So you know, they're trying to bring people into using their cloud services and roll out the red carpet for developers. Come over here, enter our ecosystem, put your CI pipelines on Azure, this kind of stuff. So I. I think that there are enough solid business reasons for Microsoft to welcome all developers that it would be very, very painful and you know, very, very, very quick way to destroy the value that they've just spent a lot of money for. It would be really bad for their business if they started screwing with what you could put in GitHub. So I think that there's a strong commercial incentive for them to not you know, use this kind of cross monopoly thing to, you know, to mess with GitHub and cause problems for us there. Um, I would be very surprised if they would ever do that because they've paid billions for that. Right? They, what they want to do is be like all developers. We're open for business. Come and use Windows, use Azure. We have GitHub here for you. Isn't this great? You know, join the family, stay in the family. Um, so I don't think that there's a commercial incentive for them to, to abuse that position. I think it would destroy the trust that they have in that, that very trusted brand. It's just an opinion, but uh, I mean, we could deal. We have GitHub. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, yes, and the idea of um, getting uh, kids onto a Linux desktop. And uh, there are other folks that are thinking about this. Anyone who is like a parent slash sysadmin for like 8, 9, 10, 12 year olds, especially who download a lot of Minecraft mods, get pretty sick of the viruses. Um, really, really, really quickly. And uh, so, you know, an, a, another niche or another uh, aspect to that um, Linux desktop for kids might be the to target the uh, parent sysadmin with the, the virus thing. Because once kids figure out like, oh, we can download free stuff on the internet, it's like, whoa, oh, <laughs> who are these ladies? Never mind, okay. <laughs> You're getting a new operating system tomorrow. Go to bed. So, uh, yeah, so I think that's a good, I, I, I think that's a really, there's already a little energy there as far as like, yeah, I would like to not deal with all the Windows viruses for my children. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, the internet's terrible, it's full of people, people are terrible, you shouldn't talk to them. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, as I, um, I you know, w with, this, uh, with this hope to move to this nonprofit model and, and just have this kind of mission motivation, then um, I think it makes it much easier for us to find those allies, to, to find other nonprofits, to find individuals who are motivated to, to do the same things that we're doing. Um, I've had so many conversations with my kind of commercial endless hat on where it's like, oh, that's fantastic, well, let's go here, do this. I'm like, so you guys are nonprofit? Like, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that we can now have that, um, that move towards the kind of mission focus and we can kind of take that commerciality out of the room so that we can actually focus on the goal because uh, the goal is, is bigger than us and it's really important. Um, so going back to this new market thing, what I feel is a problem um, is the first thing that they do is look at like other countries like um, uh, USA or parts of Europe or Japan and look what are they using and basically just wanting to use exactly this what they are using and feeling like everything else is subpar because when it's great, why aren't Europe's, uh, Europeans or Americans using it? So is this actually a problem? And how would you overcome that problem? It is very much a problem. Um, it's actually the reason why my first slide was about the whole world. Um, it's the reason why um, Endless launched two years ago, Endless Code, and, and more recently, uh, Endless Hack uh, at CES, uh, you know, the biggest electronics show in the US, um, that 
we need to take a worldwide approach to this. The idea of going into uh, you know, a, a developing world country, emerging markets, however you call it, but you know, the, the have-nots and saying that this is for you, it's patronizing, right? It's like, I don't want this thing. I mean, even if it is brilliant for them, actually, it works very well. It, it solves needs that, that do exist in you know, rural Indonesia that, that don't exist in you know, downtown New York. Funnily, they do exist if you go into the Appalachian Mountains and you have no internet there. Actually, we have solved a problem that exists in the US. Um, but this idea of, of learning to code is, is something that can kind of transcend that, that we can actually sell something to you know, kind of very wealthy and, and people who are disadvantaged, and we can give it to people who have no means to buy a computer because we can do these philanthropic initiatives. Um, but yeah, the, the success of our brand and of our mission um, within the US, and a lot of the tech press is written in the US and it gets exported across the world. Um, uh, and the lady who sells computers in the store in Indonesia, she's, when there's no one in the store, she's going to be reading you know, TechCrunch or whatever and, and hearing the tech press that's being written um, in, in the Western world. So um, yes, that's a very, very important point. And it, it, in, in some senses, it explains the strategy shift of Endless to, to say, we have all of this great stuff that, that you know, addresses real problems uh, in, in a developing world. But what we need is to actually market something that, that solves problems everywhere in the world. Uh, and there, if we have success in the US market, if people understand the purpose of Enders, if people understand the purpose of what we're trying to achieve, then that's something that's compelling and successful there. It gets nice press. People know what it is. That first meeting that we have with you know, an OEM in, in Brazil is much easier. Because like, oh yeah, yeah, I heard about that. That's cool. That's really interesting. Now let's talk. And so yeah, that, that's the key that we need. So, so this kind of doing something that's global and works for everyone is, is very, very important. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, I think this is a great idea to get younger kids started earlier on our platform, right? It's a great way to hook, hook them early. It's what Apple did back in the day with getting in schools with MacBooks and stuff in schools. Um, uh, so great idea. Love that. Um, have we put a lot of thought yet into how we can lower the bar to attract those younger kids to, I know, I know you're working on games and things, right, that could bring them in, but from a technical point of view, getting like middle school age kids coding for GNOME, you know, could be a little tricky. So we need to put some thought into how we can do that. Um, but also an offer, you know, as you know, I have access to hundreds of middle school age kids from various socioeconomic backgrounds that we could expose these kids to test what we're working on. Um, so yeah. I, and I would be interested in participating in, uh, in this. Um, we, we have one idea, right? So we have, we have a few ideas, and that's the reason why um, different parts of Endless are working on uh, different strategies. Um, the Ender Studios, I think, are launching soon as, as Terminal 2, and they have a, a series of games that actually bring you from you know, kind of clicking and editing some properties and all the way up to eventually like writing your own games in Unity. But that's a whole kind of pipeline where um, the, the ability to kind of hack the games you're playing is, is the, the way that you learn code. Um, I don't know specifically what the answer is to do that with GNOME. Um, I mean, our first prototype of Flip to Hack was, you know, you, you have the app, you click the button, and then suddenly on the other side, it's GNOME Builder. It's fantastic, right? But that's a bit of a jump. <laughs> so. Um, there's maybe, diff maybe we need like a team within GNOME that's focused on this. Uh, um, I, it, it's the reason why the, the prize is, is open, because we don't have all of the answers here. So, so we, we want to build this partnership where we can, we can apply our best brains to this together. Um, because if that works, then it, it works to sell the products, but it works to bring people to GNOME as well. So it, it's money well spent. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.